Today's sponsors are Angelo's Interiors, specialising in kitchens, bedrooms and bathrooms. Go and visit their showroom today in Gillingham. Their web address is angelosinteriors.com and Dimidici Associates, Chartered Structural and Civil Engineers. Based in the UK with a worldwide reach. Visit their website on dimidiciassociates.com. Welcome to the Cheryl Podcast. Stand in front of the camera, or right in front of yeah. it. You can do whatever you want, like you this. Yeah, there you go. John Carlo of Rock Hard Nutrition and Personal Training and Action. <laughs> <laughs> See, for, for someone that's nervous, yeah, uh, he's all right. <laughs> Right, okay, so we've got a couple of introductions. We've got John Carlo here from Rock Hard Nutrition and Personal Training, and he's a number of other things, fellow bass player. Love some of that for that. Well, well done. Yeah, good start. Yeah, fellow bass player. Good start. Also a, a games master, which I want to talk about as well. Oh, uh, sorry, excellent. mate, I'm adjusting. Mm. And we've got, I've got another stand-in. This is called Hello. Rach Backup. Well, Backup Rach. Mm. Rach number two. You all right, Rach? Are you nervous? Uh, a little bit, yes. First podcast okay. that I've done, but... Oh. Uh, yeah, it's all right. It's just a chat. So, obviously, <laughs> I'm Simon Burridge. My wife is Rachel Burridge. This is Rachel Kerridge. This is the nearest I could get. I don't know. I found it's her on the street. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I thought, oh, she'd do. She's near enough. So, Rachel Kerridge, lovely to have you. Thank you, we'll be Simon. Talking about, we'll be talking to you a bit more because you're a teacher, aren't you? A, per, a personal teacher. That doesn't sound right. Um, I'm a private tutor. A private tutor. <laughs> a private tutor. I've gone all American as well. So yeah, you're a private tutor. But we'll chat with you later on because we're going to have a separate podcast for you if you play cards, right? Oh, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> right. But Rachel's here to help interview John. How you doing, mate? Getting there. Yeah. Got here eventually. Yeah. <laughs> and sat and have let him down big time. Yes. But never mind. So tell us about yourself and about Rock Hard Nutrition. Oh, right. Oh, where to begin? Where shall I begin, Simon? Um, so, uh, my name's John Carlo. I was born in Pembury Hospital in 1979. I had a son that was born in Pembury Hospital. Yeah. Was it in 1979? Mm, don't, don't give me questions like that. Um, 2003. Oh, oh, 2001. Right. Oh, 2001. Bit later. Yeah, sorry. Um, Yes, and so that means I'm one of those feral Gen Xers that they talk about on TikTok. Um, and I'm a Gen X. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're not, are you? You're millennial, aren't you? I'm a millennial. Oh, yeah. one of those 80, filthy millennials. Eighty-eight. Oh. Eighty-eight. Yeah. Eighty-eight. Right. Oh. We're nearly there of giving everyone our credit card details, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but carry on. Um, oh, right. So I have spent most of my life living in Tunbridge in Kent. Uh, I moved to Maidstone in 2017 with my partner, Michaela, and we live kind of near the centre of the town. Um, I am now a personal trainer. I became a personal trainer in, I think I started doing it professionally in 2016. And probably, had, no, no, I got the qualification in 2016 and I started doing it full time in 2018. So I did it part time for a while, while I worked a full time job at the environment agency where I was for about 10 years. Um, Forgot about the environmental agency bit. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Well, oh, it's a, it's a long and twisted tale. Um, yeah. So, well, I mean, I was at the environment agency for 10 years before that. I mean, I've done all sorts of things, so I'll get to the PT bit in a minute, but I've, I, I, um, so, I mean, I, I didn't do very well at school. I, I, um, I went to the skin school in Tunbridge Wells. So up until the end of primary school, I was doing all right. Now, uh, we'll come, uh, this feeds into something that will come up later on, mm -hmm. but, um, I went to, uh, the skin school in Tunbridge Wells and, um, I was quite bright, but also quite lazy. Um, <laughs> and so I managed to pretty much coast all the way through school until I started my A-levels and then I kind of dropped out because i couldn't keep up because actually for a levels you actually have to do some work and mm -hmm. uh typical boy isn't it yeah <laughs> um you needed a good tutor I, I needed a good tutor well i mean I, it's I, not your time yet <laughs> <laughs> uh 
Um, but I, I dropped out of I dropped out of skin school in the uh, in the upper six, and then I thought, oh, I need to have another go at this. So I went to West Kent College and failed my levels again due to extreme not studying. And um, I didn't really know why this was. Um, I, I, you know, I kind of wanted to be a good student, but wasn't. Um, I kind of started uh, my career of work. Then I did various temp jobs. <laughs> Uh, Let me stop you there. Yeah, of course. How long do you reckon? Sorry, I've just remembered the sign. Oh, I'm yes, so sorry, John. And I am question. interested in what you're saying. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How long do you reckon before that falls off? I don't know. 23 minutes. That's what I think. Right, okay, oh, starting from accurate. now 23 minutes. <laughs> sorry, John. Carry on. Um, so, uh, yes, I started doing uh, various temp jobs, retail jobs, uh, did a couple of office jobs. Eventually, I became a bar manager, which was an exciting time of my life. I spent about five years as bar manager. I Where? Kind of, Went well in Tunbridge. I went in kind of on the shop floor just as a part time barman. And I used to live in Hadlow, so whereabouts in Tunbridge did you? Uh, well, the first, uh, the first pub I worked in was the Station House, which is right by Tunbridge Station. And yep. uh, I, I worked there for a bit part time, yep. and then the owner of that pub owned several other pubs in the town. He isn't a he doesn't own pubs anymore. He does he does something else now. Um, but he also owned the Punch and Judy, which is behind the police station. Right. And yeah, he also owned is. the Ivy House at the top of the high street. Um, I, I quite like Tunbridge. Yeah, I, I, like I, I liked it. I just couldn't afford to live there. Oh, so. right, fair <laughs> enough, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yes, yeah, so I, I ended up working uh, full time in the Punch and Judy under the owner of this small bar group. And after not very long, I ended up going back to the station house as the manager. So I think I was in the... Punch and Judy for a while, learning how to keep the cellar and all that sort of thing. Then I became the manager of the station house. I was there for about a year. Then I managed the Ivy House for about a year. And then I came back and managed the station house. And I had, a, at that time, I had keys to all three pups. So I was kind of like the general manager. Um, and uh, the pay was terrible. Most of my money went back over the bar. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I'm surprised my liver didn't crawl up my throat and slap me. But um, it was, you know, fun times. It's a familiar story for me, actually, because mm. I think quite a lot of people end up working in a bar. They don't really know what to do. And then you get sucked into it. And mm. but I feel like it did actually give me a lot of transferable skills. It taught me so much about life and mm. people because you meet so many yeah. different people. Well, you met, and you drinking. met Rachel in the bar, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, You were I working did, with Rachel, didn't you, in the yeah. bar? Yeah, a long time, way before my time. <laughs> but it's, mm. uh, yeah, it's good, it's good fun. But I think it's a young man's game, really. Um, I mean, I... It's quite a short career path as well, you know, because unless you're going to yeah. buy a pub of your own, once you yeah. become a manager of someone Very else's Very unsociable bar, hours as yeah, well. Yeah, it's all day, isn't it? Buy into the lifestyle, don't you, yeah. really? I mean, your social life's pretty much your yeah. job at the same time. Yeah, because, you know, the people it, you work with, the people you serve, they yeah. become your yeah. buddies. And it's, I mean, it's, it's fun, but, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't do it again. Um, not now, but... Um, yeah, so I did that for a while, and then um, I had a big falling out with the with the manager... And just ended up walking out one day, you know, I mean, no one really kind of gives notice or anything like that mm, in the bar business. <laughs> um, I mean, and I think like the night after I left, I don't think the doors ever opened again under that, man, oh. under that ownership. Um, but uh, after that, I kind of fell completely by accident into a job at the Environment Agency because one of one of my regular bar flies in the Ivy House, mm. um, who I got to be quite good friends with, uh, he worked at the Environment Agency he said, look, we've got this temp project going, you know, you're wasting your life in here. And it took me a very long time to come around to the idea and the fact that I'd actually left, <laughs> uh, left my job to yeah, kind yeah. of give it a go. But I kind of went there as a temp. I was a temp on a, a, a temporary project officer for like nine months or something like that. And then towards the end of the year, because normally uh, you don't stay as a temp. We, then you didn't stay as a temp for more than a year because if you stayed for a year, they'd have to give you kind of yeah. more employment yeah, rights or yeah. something. Mm. So they have to kind of unemploy you and re-employ you if they mm. if they want to keep you. But there was a job. Um, I applied for this job. Um, this is normally like a, uh, a job that you would normally have a degree for, but, you know, I had relevant experience because mm. I've been a project officer for a year. And I got the job um, and no one was more surprised than me. Um, <laughs> it goes but, like that sometimes, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I was there for about, uh, just coming up for 11 years, I think. Um, but um, one thing that happens a lot in government agencies, you have change projects. So mm -hmm. um, all, big, all big companies are subject to kind of internal politics and all that sort of thing. So you have, whenever there's a new area manager come in, 
Um, you have change projects. They want to kind of put their stamp on things and mm. make things more efficient and move things around. Mm. Um, so I survived my first change project, which was merging two regions. And, um, and then I survived a second change project, which was taking my function and making it into a national function. So I became part of a virtual national team mm. and i thought i'm never going to survive another one of these um, <laughs> that's the spirit is it nothing well, like a bit of confidence I mean, it's i mean it, one it's incredibly stressful and despite the fact that the management of um government bodies uh like to be seen as good communicators and mm. and man looking after their staff and that sort of thing um it really wasn't, you know, they were, all the emails were like, we're committed to telling you everything. And then they wouldn't tell you anything. Yeah. So, um, so I was there. They were uh, the same. Yeah. <laughs> they were yeah. all the same. And uh, so uh, I became part of this uh, big, uh, big group. Wasn't really very happy. Um, and I thought to myself, if there's another change project, I'm never going to survive. What would I do if I could do anything I wanted mm. to do? And I thought, well, at the time, I was uh, very much into karate and fitness training, and I was like, well, what would be the best thing that I could do if I got made redundant and they gave me, what, a few thousand quid, what would I do with it? So I thought, I will uh, train as a personal trainer because I spent a lot of time in the gym, a lot of time doing fitness-related activities. I thought it would be good if I could monetize my interest. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I had the idea at the time um, that maybe there was a bit of a niche that... Um, I could fit into because um, I am very much into rock and metal and bands <laughs> and festivals and all that sort of thing. And I thought, um, who has a more unhealthy lifestyle than a rock band, you know? So maybe I can become a um, personal trainer and specialize in um, touring, bands. touring with bands. Yeah. That's and a really good idea. It, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, and at the time, I thought I'm going to call my business Rock Hard Bodies because it's going to be uh, very much kind of tying into musical things. Um, and I really annoyed my boss at the environment agency by saying, hey, mate, can I can I take my entire annual leave entitlement in one go, please? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he was like. He wasn't very happy about it. And uh, eventually he agreed. Um, so I took six weeks off in one go. Um, and went off and did an intensive, um, an intensive diploma in fitness instruction and personal training. So now I have a question about that. Go on. Do you have to, do you have to display how fit you are when you're doing that? Or is it just techniques for people that you're going to be instructing? L luckily, Am you I don't. Sense luckily you don't, luckily you don't, uh, they, they don't do a fitness test on you. Um, I, what, before I went, I was quite worried because I was not in the best shape of my life. Um, and I wasn't as young as I expected a lot of the people there to be. Mm. Um, and when I turned up on the first day, the first few people came in were kind of, you know, um, young lads who must only have been 18 or 19. And I was like, oh dear, I'm going to be the <laughs> granddad here. Um, but, um, as it turned out, I was by no means the oldest or the fattest mm. in the room. So, um, so that actually made me feel a lot better. And I had actually tried to learn as much as I could about anatomy and, and, uh, things from, you know, uh, fitness instruction mm. before I went and no one else had really done that. So, right, so, um, so actually I, I found getting the qualification relatively easy, but, um, I don't know. I, I suppose I'm probably more academically inclined than a lot of the people who might seek to become mm. fitness professionals. Mm. So, so the, uh, you know, the stuff on paper, the I did work, not, the theory yeah, work I found quite easy. Yeah. Um, I think the hardest day, because we did a unit in circuit classes and there were like 20 or 30 of us and they split us into like three groups and each one of us had to do a circuit class for everyone else, right. which meant that you had to do like six 40 minute circuit <laughs> classes back <laughs> to back. <laughs> and the next day, um, I was a bit sore, um, but yes, I, I got my qualification um, and not long afterwards, I started training kind of people that I knew. So um, uh, a friend of mine, Bridget, who probably won't see this, but if she does, hey, Bridget. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, she, Bridget. <laughs> Bridget Nilsson, he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, she uh, was my first uh, PT client and I trained her for a while. She is a woman in her, she, she was a woman in her 50s, mid to late 
50s, I think. And um, we train twice a week for quite a long time, like three months, half a year. Um, and, you know, really, she she absolutely loved it. You know, she, right. she lost weight. She got a lot fitter and healthier. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was really nice. So, um, but yeah, there, there are obviously others afterwards but you know the the, the first ones <laughs> the first one stays with you um what you said i just want to take you back to <laughs> what you were saying about when you walked in the room and you thought oh no you know there's also sort of you know typical gym buddies i think mm. with personal trainer people want to have that personal connection with them and mm. actually we're all different shapes and sizes you know i think i would feel quite intimidated if i went to personal trainer and they were an 18 year old 19 year old guy that probably wouldn't be my my choice. So I think mm. it's really good that actually there are people of different shapes, sizes, ages, different career backgrounds yes. as well, yeah. um, just so that you can make that connection with people. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say this because it's, um, you know, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of the people who uh, I have trained, um, and yeah. I, I sort of, hmm, I'll come to that, but a lot of the people I've trained said we were very glad that you weren't in, you know, didn't, we would have been intimidated if you had a six pack, a six and, pack yeah. and you know we're like eighteen years old and I'm sure blemish you have free got a and pack, shining. Yeah. And, well, <laughs> it's, it's it's well insulated. Um, <laughs> um, it's there somewhere. It's, it's coming. coming. It's it's coming. coming. Uh, by the end of the year, visible six pack. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yes, so I I think there's a lot to be said for that. I mean I. Mm. Uh, I have used personal trainers myself um, while I was training to get my karate black belt. And I, I kind of found um, taking advice from people who were probably less than half my age, who had probably only just left school mm. um, and were probably in good shape more because life hadn't had a chance to, <laughs> you know, um, we you know that suck the life out of you and, and kind of, you know, because it balancing your career and your family and and your own personal health you know we we always tend to um neglect ourselves and give more to our yeah. our careers and our families and you know I, I think it's a it's a terrible thing really how self-care is kind of vilified and people are not very people are not very into looking after themselves mm. uh, in fact in a way people are quite the opposite you know there's this kind of mindset where it's like there's some sort of virtue in working yourself half to death yes. and doing unpaid overtime and all that sort of thing. And I've always thought that was madness. Mm. Um, so, you know, this whole kind of conscious quitting movement, it shouldn't be called the conscious quitting movement. No. It should be called the work-life balance movement yeah. or the Absolutely. I'm not going to flog myself to death movement. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, do, if you are contracted to do a job, that doing it should be enough. But, yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry, I, I, think, I digress. No, no, that's, I'm <clears throat> glad you said that. I mean, you've made me digress now, but I was just thinking... <laughs> You know, the whole self-care um, kind of motion, I think it sort of goes one way or the other. You know, you've got people that where it seems, oh, all they do is take, you know, bubble baths and go for walks. Um, so they feel a bit fluffy wuffy and you think, oh, well, I can't fit that into my busy schedule. And then, like you say, you've got the other side of just flogging yourself to death, not being able to say no to anything. Yeah. Um, but actually, the truth is, it is exactly as you said, it's about the balance. You know, we can't sit in a bubble bath all day. <laughs> Um, or do the things that you want to do all of the time, but it is that balance and that whole, that holistic side, you know, you can't just do one thing without the other, you know, you mm. have got to straighten out your diet, get the exercise and just have that all round Definitely. balance. And I mean, I'm people, not a personal trainer, but. There's also people <laughs> afraid to go to gyms, especially gyms, because I know, John, I, I listen yeah. to you, we're in the same network and I listen to you every week. Mm. Well, mean, the judging eyes of, you know other people and some people that does affect doesn't personally affect me i don't care who looks at me <laughs> well I, no just, one I, just, absolutely. I just walk into the gym naked so um <laughs> but it does affect people and mm, well, what yeah, i like about so. your, your your setup is it's you know near, literally one-on-one -on -one, maybe mm. four-on-one -on would you say maximum oh well uh two-on-one -on -one for me because uh, it is a i yes it would be a bit cozy with more than three people in there mm. um, you like the idea so, of two-on-one rach um, You've got a one trap mind. I'm on about <laughs> physical stuff. <laughs> sorry, John. Sorry about that. So uh, allow me to uh, elucidate on uh, on what you just said, Simon. Mm. So um, uh, yes, the the high street gym um, in this current day and age, um, there are two things that it doesn't do very well. Um, one 
is you have um, the kind of people who I particularly like to appeal to. So the kind of people who are not very interested in fitness, don't really know anything about fitness and are probably ashamed of their own physical condition. Um, so they might also be possibly neuro, uh, neurodivergent. So mm. they might, you know, they might be uh, ASD or ADHD or something like that. So people like that are going to find the uh, the high street gym a bit intimidating. So it's going to have bright lights, loud music, uh, noisy machines. A lot of people who look like they know exactly what they're doing. And all of those things are very, very alienating if you haven't got a clue what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So you walk into your high street gym and you're like, wow, everyone here knows what they're doing. I haven't got a clue. And a a gym with a thriving membership, um, I mean, you'll go in there and it'll be busy all the time, but they'll probably 80% of their membership will never sit in the door because I think that's how gyms make so much money because they make more money out of people who don't go than people yeah. who do go. Um, but uh, that's beside the point. Um, but yes, the the people... The, the, the fitness instructors there, they might spend half an hour, 45 minutes with you to give you a basic program to start off with and and then leave you to get on with it. And that isn't going to impart a lot of knowledge. And it's, yeah, it's it's going to be really hard work. And a lot of people do not do not last very long under those conditions. Mm. So so they they join the great majority of gym goers who have a membership and don't go. Um and people like that really need some help. Um, the other kind of high street gym, the uh, so that that's a high street gym with employed fitness instructors. So that's the best kind. Mm. The worst kind, and I probably shouldn't name any names, but the the budget high street gyms um, are staffed by self employed personal trainers who pay floor rent by doing inductions. Those people oh. don't make any money at all unless they can sell PT. So in some gyms, they're sailing about like sharks looking yeah. for people to try and sell PT mm. to. I or, didn't know that. <clears throat> I never knew that. No. I never knew that. Or, uh, or, or but the, yeah, but, I mean, some of those are obviously very good trainers, but they have to make some money. And so they have to sell PT. I think that model is unethical mm. because it means that you've got people uh, run, uh, people run in the gym for free. So, I mean, the first job interview I went to to work in a gym, um, they said we're going to pay you minimum wage for the first uh, the first six months. And I was like, oh, what, what will the what will the pay be after that? There won't be any. You'll pay us. <laughs> and I was just like, are you joking? You know, this wow. is ridiculous. Yeah. So, um, at that point, I just thought, well, I I don't think I'm ever going to work in a high street gym. Now, I belong <clears throat> I belong to a large high street gym. Mm. We, we just passed it when I was getting it and. Um, to be honest, I, I'm quite happy with the gym there. Like I say, I don't have any nerves of going into a gym. And there's a lot of, I don't want to mention their name because I don't want to drop them in it, but there's a lot of PT people in there. And I feel that they must be getting a wage because they're not doing the shark thing. Well, So um, hmm. I'm not I'm not 100% sure um, if that gym is doing that, but I'll tell you about the gym after this podcast. And you can tell me if you know it's, if it's the one that we're Oh, thinking. well. I mean, there's 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 at least a couple um, mm. of budget gyms that yeah they they don't employ any they employ a manager but they don't employ any floor staff at all they're all right. self employed um, but yeah so I mean I I don't I don't particularly like either of those things I mean I used to go to a gym that I really loved in Tunbridge uh, it is now a budget gym because it was it it was uh, went into administration and was bought by a uh, one of these budget gyms, which shall remain nameless. Um, <clears throat> There's one gym I know of in Tunbridge. <laughs> it's like just off the high street. Yeah, so you get, just around the corner from the, from the you, station. You're heading up towards the station, then you turn right immediately, just before the park entrance, and it's there. Yeah, if you're coming, if you're coming yeah. from the other end of yeah. town, yeah, yeah, that, I know the one. Yeah. But I, I went in there for years. I, I absolutely loved that gym, mm. and that was when it was, you know, a, a, a proper staffed gym. Owned gym, yeah, and you know, I used to go to the classes there and I mm. used to go in there like four or five times a week and it was um you know it was really nice really enjoyed it mm. um it and then it was the first modern looking gym I've ever experienced I think yeah, walking it's, past it I never went in it yeah, yeah. Past it. <laughs> it was it, it was really nice and yeah. I mean now someone who knows what they're doing in a gym can can gyms like that are going to work very well for people who've got the knowledge the beginners that's the, uh, problem, yeah. the beginners are, are yeah. uh, you know it's they're not. They're probably not going to do very well in a place like that. Mm. Um, 
I feel like I've got so many questions. I definitely want to go back to the karate thing at some point. Oh, but lo- while Matt, you're talking about the gym. We barely touched the surface with this bloke. <laughs> we might have to have twice. Um, while we're talking about the gym, <clears> so you, <throat> you were just describing there how yours is different in some ways to the, the high street gym, or probably in many ways. Um, but you were saying there about the how many people you come in, mm. how, how many people you get in at a time. Um, and you say like two two people will come and see you at one one time or one on one. And what else makes your gym different? Is the uh, is the environment different? Well, I I um, I work from home. Okay. Um, and my private studio is in my loft conversion. Excuse me, I'm just going to clear my throat. <coughs> Not into the mic. So. <laughs> well done. Everyone um, does it in the mic usually. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, so my loft conversion is a PT studio. Oh, so, okay. Um, I have got. Um, free weights mm. and various bits of equipment in there. Um, I don't have cardio machines or anything like that, but um, it is just about the right size for one-to-one or couples PT. So I have had couples come, especially if they were um, kind of in the run-up to their uh, wedding or oh, something. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I've also, you know, it's, it's funny. Some couples love to train together. Others are like, "Oh no, I don't want him watching me sweat." It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> and you're um, about to get married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the least of your worries. Mm. Um, yeah. But the but the good thing about that is that um, the atmosphere is you know it's it's a sorry about my phone. It could be Rachel telling me she's really ill. So oh. <laughs> carry on. Right. She's she's right there. <laughs> <laughs> Not backup, Rachel. Real oh, Rachel. Back, real Rachel. My yeah. Rachel. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Fine. Um, Fine. Um, John, carry on. I know. Um, come on, brain. Where were we? So uh, the nice thing about that is that uh, we can control the the sound, the light level, everything. So I've got a dimmer switch in there. Yeah. Um, or we can play whatever music you like, mm. uh, as long as it's not gospel. Um, <laughs> I, I joke. I have played gospel in there for for one person who came in and wanted gospel. Um, um, I had to grip my teeth a little bit because yeah. uh, I, I kind of prefer a bit of rock and metal. But um, <laughs> you went with the client and what they the wanted. Client. Yeah. Um, but uh, because it's um, because it's that kind of um, less intimidating environment, mm. um, you can take your time with people and help to introduce them to uh, fitness a bit more gently, um, and try to educate as well as you know. It's it's not just about beasting people and making them throw heavy weights around. It's yeah. It's kind of about um, you know making sure that you um, understand what you're trying to achieve why you're doing what you're doing, how it works, um, what people need to do outside of sessions mm. to um, to get their best best possible results. Because, um, I mean, when it comes to training, it's kind of like 80-20, uh, you know, 20% of it is, is fitness training, 80% of it is uh, nutrition. So um, it takes a long, a long time for people to get that, I think. I think a lot of people are like, yeah. I'm going to, Drink beer and eat pizza, but I'll train a lot. Yeah. It's like yeah. doesn't, the math or, doesn't add up. You know, we'll, bu- we'll book our PT session. That's it. We're done for the week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but it's, um, it's, it's good in that, you know, you can kind of try to educate people a bit. Um, I, I like the idea that people, you, you don't have to be, you don't have to be my client forever if you don't want to be. You know, if you, if you come to me for three or four months, I can tell you what you need to be doing and you can take mm. that knowledge elsewhere if you want to. And, uh, but the nice thing is that when if people are comfortable and they're happy, then 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 they stay. They and it's continue. lovely to have some long term yeah. clients because you can, you know, you can really watch their goals progress over you know over years instead of over just a few months. Um, I think yeah. the I think the benefit of having a personal trainer is you've got someone that you know is going to be um, looking at your progress. Yeah, because it's like being trying, held to account. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, you're held accountable for your progress. Mm. And that's why I've got you in, John. Because <laughs> I'm 50 this year. And yes, I go to the gym and stuff. But I'm pretty, I'm all over the place with my nutrition. I go carb free, which is very successful, but it's not something you can um, maintain really. Mm. Not and have a fun life. Brave man. <laughs> yeah, and it works for me. Carb free does work for me. But the mm. more I go back to carb free, the worse I get at You know, I've got no mm. one to look at me and say, well, you know, no, I've got no one, like you say, no one to be accountable yeah. for. I mean, 
that wrong way around, but you know, having, what I mean. having an accountability partner for your goals makes it makes an enormous difference. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. it makes it easier to get some motivation, gives you someone to bounce ideas. Exactly. Off. I mean, so. I've I've done low carb and had it work for me, but it usually only works the first time. Um, right, oh, that's and that's going wrong. there's there's oh, no okay. physiological reason for that. It's purely psychological. I mean, yeah, uh, it's the same with any fad diet. Mm. Um, if you are invested in it and you really believe it. Uh, and you are at that time in your life really committed to your training. Yes, it works, but not because you are doing low carb. It works because, because you're you invested. are fo- you're in both focused mm. and invested. And I think that's the problem mm. with me. I'm not invested in it. If I'm honest, mm. I'm not invested in it. I've used Rachel being ill. Other Rachel, Rachel number one. Real being, Rachel being ill is an excuse to. Oh, don't worry about that for now. Just concentrate on Rachel. You know. Oh yeah, I need your help till oh, till well, August. Absolutely, and to. we can monitor it, and we can keep. We can get you back or something before. Oh, well, that'd be great. Well, I mean, well, if if uh, if you can come for uh, uh, a a weigh in or something, yeah. I can get you on my biometric scales. Um, <laughs> yeah, we we'll do it. They they yeah. electrocute like you. It doesn't say, hurt. I'm, I'm happy at my current gym. It's right next to the studio. Yeah. Let's be honest. So for me and your your Maidstone, aren't you? Yeah, and we're we're Rochester Strood area. So, um, but um, nutrition wise. If you could be my nutritionist and yeah, advisor, absolutely. let's do it. How did the um, nutrition thing <clears throat> come about? I'm guessing that you wouldn't have done that as part of your PT course. That was a no, separate thing. No, no. So um, initially I did the uh, level two and three qualification, which mm. is fitness instruction and personal training. And um, I thought, oh, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do for level four? So I signed up to do a uh, nutrition uh, nutrition course and that was a distance learning course, which I did with uh, Future Fit Training, who are a training provider. And I picked that one particularly because um, that one allows me to put letters after my name. So okay. having having a, uh, a level four diploma in nutrition allows me to call myself John Carlo MRPH, <laughs> no, MRSPH, sorry, which is the um, Royal Society, member of the Royal Society for Public Health. Um, Mr. Sup- <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not on there to, to add Super. the letters on yeah, all right, all <laughs> um but uh yes i uh I, I did that um it took me about a year to do it um you kind of um do it through their training portal mm. and then you have coursework that you have to submit and that sort of thing and it's thank you um <laughs> yes i was doing that during lockdown so um i was quite lucky in a way because um it was the fact that I had a lockdown and couldn't see any clients face to face that kind of made me yeah. focus on finishing the course because uh, otherwise it would probably have taken me more than a year. Yeah. Uh, they said to me, oh, you could you could do it in like half a year, nine months if you really focus. But most people take about a year and I was like, oh, I'll do it in three. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, six months later, I hadn't even started it. So um, but I did uh, kind of focus on that and a bit more during lockdown. Um Yes, as I said, I uh, got my qualification, started doing um, PT full time uh, 2018, I think, like March, April 2018. Mm. So, and then not long after that, um, you know, I I couldn't train people face to face anymore. So that was a bit of a shock. Um, That's how my uh, third career path came out, actually. Um, But where were we? I've completely lost my thread. Um, you were just saying that uh, the course, you were able to do from, the right, course right, because right. of new, um, mm, because yeah. of the lockdown. You had mm. time to really mm. embark um, on it. And I mean, nutrition is incredibly important. Um, I mean, I didn't mention this before, but I have uh, Crohn's disease, um, okay. uh, which is a uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Mm. So that affects the uh, affects your intestines and it can make you really, really ill. Um, I am incredibly lucky there it is there we go Ooh, how well many after minutes 25 is that? i reckon oh, well after 20, well after 20, 20, we have to check it. We, we all glance up at that clock but that clock has absolutely nothing to do with the time oh, does it not? it's just what's on the camera <laughs> <laughs> we, everyone do, does that they all, well how long i have no idea <laughs> we'll work it out later but go on Let's so you're off in it uh, a little bit right crohn's disease yes i'm very i'm i'm incredibly lucky uh in that i have a medication kind of regime that actually works and I am more or less able to have a normal life. A lot mm-hmm. of people with Crohn's disease are debilitated, cannot work. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that 
being a disabled personal trainer kind of gives me a bit more uh, a bit more empathy when it comes to other disabled uh, potentially disabled clients and that sort of thing. Yeah. But, um, but nutrition is incredibly important if you have that kind of problem. So, um, and it's also incredibly important for um, exercise generally. So, I mean, the, the best results you get are from kind of attacking it from both sides. You know, you have to have the training and the nutrition. Mm. But in reality, the nutrition is probably more important. Abs are made in the kitchen, not in the gym. Um, so I wanted to be able to offer... That is a good quote. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I had thought of it. But, um, <laughs> but the... Uh, yes, I wanted to be able to give a, a more of a holistic sort of service. So um, not sure what else I'm going to try and add to it. I was thinking about yoga or Pilates maybe, but... Yeah. Um, that feels a bit disingenuous because I've never been to a Pilates yeah. class. So. Have you heard of um, Diamond Dallas Page? He's a wrestler. He's a, used to be an American wrestler. It rings a bell. And he's got a, he's got this yoga called DDP yoga. Mm. Have a look at that. That's more an intensive style yoga, and it it's really good. He's he's mm. got heart monitors on people, so he knows that their their heart rate is actually high enough. Sort of high that. enough. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. It's really worth a look. You'll be able to find some bits on um, YouTube. I'll try and remember that. Maybe, yeah. And I've, it's very I've, good. It's I've, literally yoga, but it's not yoga, you know. Because so he has American footballers now, you know. That's some head. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, Ex-wrestlers or wrestlers that are still going and, and mm. they've been in pain for years. Um, he, he even had a, um, a guy that was crippled. He couldn't walk and he was in the army years ago. And um, he just basically couldn't walk. Who decided to do it? And now he's running. Wow! This guy's running, and it's just based on yoga, mm. intensive sort of yoga. Well worth a look. Yeah. There might be something similar like that you want to look into. It's interesting. Yeah, because uh, mm. well, there's there's so many different kinds of yoga. I mean, I've mm. I've tried a couple. Um, and one one of them is hatha yoga, which is the which is very common. Yeah, and that is kind of uh, that's the one with the. The corpse pose and the crane pose or yeah. whatever it is and all that sort of mm. thing. So that's the one a lot of people recognise. Mm. Um, there's a Chinese form of yoga called Tang, which right. is you hold a lot more tension in your body while you're doing it. That's exactly what he does. Yeah. Um, you're, you're literally grip. You know, you're straining it all the time. You're keeping your mm. butt cheeks tight and all butt butt cheeks. But it's really good. <laughs> But his um his slogan is this ain't your mama's yoga. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it is good. I have done I have done that for a while. That sounds quite fun. And it's good. So, mm. It's good. And this is a sixty year old man that just gets his leg and puts it to the side of him, you know. And he was wrestling for years and he done a lot of damage to himself as they do. Mm. And, uh, yeah, well well worth a look. Excellent. Maybe. Okay. Mm. Brilliant. I was just going to ask about the karate now, if that's oh, all right. Oh, okay. So do you still, yeah, yeah. Do, you still think... do karate? Do you do you teach karate? Or is that that's something that you do for yourself? If oh, you like? yes, to all the above. Um, <laughs> so um, karate, um, I think, is karate saved my life. I wow. think the reason I am sitting here talking to you is because I have karate in my life. Um, I started doing karate probably in my early 20s-ish. Um, my, my first martial arts class was actually, uh, I went with a friend of mine who was a guitarist of a band I was in. That was um, Tang Soo Dao, which is a Korean form of karate. Okay. Um, and it is basically karate just with um Slight regional variations. I, I went to a few classes of that. I got a yellow belt and then I got a yellow belt with an orange tag. It all seemed very commercialized. It's what um, people into more traditional karate tend to call a muk dojo. Um, right. <laughs> and so, you know, ev ev everything's expensive. Um, everything has branding on it everything's mm. premium well everything's expensive but at the same time everything's cheap do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. um they're just so, trying to get, i think sometimes when they're trying to get things to the masses unfortunately yeah. that tends to happen doesn't yeah. it and it was you know it was, a, it was a big organization uh it's i, I imagine it's probably still going mm. um i i won't name them either i don't know if they're particularly litigious but um but they are you know i would describe them as a muk dojo and mm. i i met um my sensei, uh, Sensei Rob. Hey, Sensei Rob, if you happen to see this. Um, and 
he started uh we met him in the pub i think and he used to work as a fitness instructor and personal trainer in the favorite my favorite gym uh the only gym i really went to in uh tunbridge and um we got talking to him me and uh, uh other friends of mine got talking to him in the gym and he, mm. he he eventually said to us oh yeah i'm a black belt in karate so really it's black belt at the top well, no no not quite well but there's advanced. more there's more to it he can't so, quite he can't quite catch a fly with chopsticks okay <laughs> <laughs> um but uh so rob had Rob told us that he had got his black belt in 1979. All oh, right. Um, and he'd got it when he was a kid, basically. And he had carried on doing karate for years. So he was at, he, he went to university in America um, in, uh, what's the Mormon state? I can't remember. Ohio? Might have been. Or was it? I can't. I, I can't remember exactly. But he, he he said it was a dry state, which helped him with his studies. Um, <laughs> right, so, okay. um, but he uh, he carried on doing karate in America, and he, he you know he's got tons of awards. He's actually a very um, uh, very accomplished martial artist. Mm. Um, but he'd only ever got a black belt. Um, I don't think he'd done a great deal of teaching. Um, but it, but eventually he was persuaded to teach us some karate. So I was the only one out of our group of friends that ended up kind of in this club that um, had done any martial arts before, I think, um, or one of a very few. To start with, I think I was the only one. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going around in circles. Um, <laughs> but yes, he taught us some karate. So it was, it was a Saturday or Sunday morning. He used to turn up with terrible hangovers and, <laughs> uh, and do karate. And over the course of many years... Um, People came and went, but I stayed. Um, so, slight segue. Um, I think that um, once you hit about, probably about the age of 18, maybe a bit older, but you, you start life with structure, um, metrics of achievement. You, um, you know, when you go to school, they they grade you. They give you work to do. Yeah. They support you. You go through this kind of academic career, mm. whether you go to the university or not. You've got this. There you go. Hey, <laughs> that's what happens. Suddenly, yeah. you're yeah. out in the world, yeah. and all of that structure disappears, yeah. and there is not very much to celebrate, really. Um, so, someone like me, who I, I didn't realise at the time how how much I needed that structure. You need a yeah. Scooby snack every now and then. Um, yeah. Um, mm. But out in the world, I think I was kind of floundering, mm. you know. Um, couldn't find a job I really wanted to do. Drank far too much. Um, and I just didn't... It was like, go to work, hate job, take home money, go to pub. Um, repeat. Money. <laughs> um, and, then, and then karate actually uh, gave me a bit of discipline, gave me an interest in fitness. It gave me... Uh, uh, goals to achieve um so you know i absolutely loved it i'm not a natural at karate in fact you know um if you took all our belts away and made a load of black belts do karate in a room no one people would say oh we must be a green belt um because i'm not um i'm not a talented martial artist i'm just a martial artist who didn't stop mm. and that's what all black belts are really you're third dan now aren't you i'm a third dan yeah can you and explain the dance to me? Is it just because you've <clears> run out of colours? <laughs> well, can you be like a green belt for a Dan? You can't, can you? It's black no, belt and no. then it goes into Dan's afterwards, doesn't it? That's right. I mean, I, my karate style, I can't speak for all of them, but they all follow a similar progression. You start with what are called Q grades. Um, and you, you, usually you come in as white. So you have white, mm. yellow, orange, green, blue, purple. Some styles don't have purple. Right, okay. And then you have a number of brown belts. Some styles have two, ours has three. So, right, so okay. you go through three gradings as a brown belt. Sometimes you get a stripe on your belt or something, but, you know, that's kind of stuff's not necessary. But if you're in a McDojo, they charge you um, 30 quid for a brown belt with an extra stripe on it. Um, so, but that's the difference there. You know, I think I wore the same I just, belt. <clears> sorry, I just realised the McDojo. Have thing. you only just got that? <laughs> like yeah, because I, I thought it was some, like... Japanese word or something. No, no, Franti like franchisee mock, sort like of. Like mock dojo. I got it. I got it now. Well done. 
Very Can proud. you cut that bit out? No, that bit is not being cut out. That's, uh, Sorry, carry on. How long was it? He said that a good half hour ago. It's, it's, um, I've got it now. Well done. So, uh, You're white. fitting in for H perfectly. Uh, white, yellow, orange, green, blue, purple, brown, 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 black. So black, first down. Um, black in... He's not talking about previous relationships for people that have just... Uh, <laughs> just <laughs> um, but yeah, first, first Dan. Um, now, <sighs> black represents perfection in Japanese... Um, uh, in Japanese culture. So some schools will only ever give you a dark blue belt. For example, the first style I ever studied, which was Tang Sudao, um, their black belts don't wear black belts. They wear dark blue belts because their philosophy is that perfection is not achievable within a human lifetime. I quite like that, but black belt is supposed to represent perfection and you go from black belt first Dan and then you still wear a black belt but then you become second Dan, third Dan. Okay. And How many Dans do you get to? Is there a limit? Oh. The, if any, well, if you ever hear of a Dan higher than 10, it's probably a McDojo or some kind of right. weird ego project for a failed martial <laughs> artist right. um but yeah 10th tenth, tenth dan is the top but the 10th dan is only ever held by either the founder of a style or the style's highest ranked living practitioner right wow um and you can grade people up to one uh one grade below yourself i think so, okay so, so there's a lot of eighth dans in the world not very many ninth dans in the world mm. and not very many tenth dans in the world. A humble eighth dan, if he thinks he might be the last surviving um, uh, practitioner of his style, or the highest surviving practitioner of his style, he probably won't ever say, no, I, now I'm the tenth dan, I'm the daddy. Right. Um, <laughs> um, uh, a lot of martial artists uh, are, are quite kind of humble, so they won't do that. But so um, Are you aiming for fourth dan? I'm, I'm aiming for it. I don't think I'm eligible yet. Um, so I think between third and fourth Dan is generally a four year wait. And, um, to an extent you, you get Dan gradings by continuing to contribute to the art. Right. So, okay. um, so I got my third Dan during lockdown, um, uh, from the English karate organization and they said, Oh, well, you don't have to do a physical grading because we can't do physical gradings because we can't meet face to face to face. So Part of me was relieved and part of me feels a bit guilty that I didn't actually do a mm. karate grading for so it. You should just make karate noises over. Um... <laughs> 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 yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, you can be a third Dan. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sorry, that sounds disrespectful, but <laughs> I'm right. just doing it for comedy effect, John. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, but yeah, so I think I might be eligible for a fourth Dan next year. Oh, right. um, okay. But have, have hmm. you have ever had to use it in self-defense at all in your life? Need some wood to touch? Yeah, this white is wood. That's a lot of wood. people touch that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so touch wood. Uh, I have never had to use karate in anger in my life, and I would like to keep it that way. Mm. Yeah. Um, I. One thing. <clears throat> uh, one thing a lot of people probably don't realise, and it's probably best that they don't realise this, is that being a black belt in karate does not necessarily make you an amazing fighter. Um, I think learning self defence techniques, you kind of. Um, it, it makes you fitter and stronger and more physically confident. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, you yeah. know, if uh, if Kimbo Slice walks up behind you, um, you Slice. You, you, you're going to be you're going to be in trouble whether you're a, yeah. a third down in karate or you've it, never thrown a punch you're in your a life. Black belt in discipline is what you are. Pretty much. So, yeah, um, yeah a, a black belt does not necessarily represent um, perfection or enormous skill or anything. It means that you've mastered the basic techniques of your karate style mm. Mm. and in many ways, it's the beginning. So a lot of people have their eyes on the black belt. Once you've got a black belt, it's like, right, I can start learning some karate now mm. because it really isn't the end of the road. It's actually just a stop on the way. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a significant moment getting a black belt, um, but it's not time to retire. But a lot no. of people do. I mean, if you, if you go up the gradings, um, there are... You know more more yellow belts in the world than you can than you can count, but at each step up the mm. ladder, there's probably Pyramid less people because imagine. people aren't mm. people aren't committed to it. You know, mm. but when you get to a certain point, I suspect it probably evens out because if you've if you've gone as far as to get a brown belt, then well, 
Maybe not. <laughs> talk yourself out of it. <laughs> talk so yourself do you out teach of it. it as well? I do teach it, yes. I uh, At the moment, I only teach one class a week. I teach a 90-minute class. Um, Where? In, at your it, place? Or? That is in the Women's Institute Hall in East Farley at the moment. Okay. Um, I have got a small group of committed students, one of which is my partner, and they're all green belts at the moment. So I would dearly love to have some um, some white belts to teach again. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Do you have any information on that? How people can contact you? Well, I, I have both a website um, and a Facebook page, um, but I think my website is... And that's the spirit, yeah. Uh, <laughs> just go for it. You probably could promote another company. Oh. Yeah, but well, what do you think it is? Uh, Sankakai Karate Maidstone oh. com, I think. Sankakai Karate. S-A-N-K-U-K-A-I. Um, karate, K-A-R-A-T-E. And then Maidstone.com. Okay. Um, yeah, I yeah, I would love to. I would love for the hall not to be big enough anymore, so that I, you know, oh. that would be that would be a, a good curse to have. Right, that was so powerful. That the story of your karate, and you can tell how passionate you still are, mm. and how that's really well. It has paved into your career and your life. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with, without karate, it was karate that. Um. I think I got sort of to green or blue belt and I realized that I wasn't really fit enough to, to do it, you know, because karate will make you want to be fit. But um, karate in and of itself, um, I don't think that that's enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you need uh, to do quite additional a lot of training. I think you need to do yeah. additional training. So I, that's kind of what um, nudged me through the doors of the gym. <clears throat> and, um, and that's what, you know, kind of fueled my interest in in all of those things so yeah. you know it all comes together it all it all comes from karate so you know without karate it would uh, it wouldn't have happened and you know it it's incredibly good for your mental health you know i mean mm. I've, I've i've struggled with mental health issues for a long time i don't mind saying and uh you know it it, it can transform your life it, you know i mean i was an incredibly shy child and um i had terrible social anxiety growing up and um you know, suffered from anxiety and depression for years. Mm. And I think the only thing that really, you know, the only thing that gave any meaning to my life was karate. So, mm. you know, I mean, I obviously I had friends. I don't discount the, yeah. uh, the, the, the support that friends and family gave me. But, um, you know, kar karate was kind of like the, the thing that held me up. You've got to have so. something for yourself. You know, like yeah. you say, you can have all the support, but what's going on in your head is going mm. on mm. in your head. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, karate really, um, you know, really helped with that. And uh, I mean, years later, so like last year, the day before my 44th birthday, um, I discovered I was diagnosed with uh, ADHD. So um, I, I, looking back, it was obvious, yeah. but... It wasn't um, invented when we were kids, though. Do well, you know, <laughs> ADHD was something for the naughty kids who couldn't yeah. sit still, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, uh, the, the problem is, if you've got ADHD and you're quite clever... Um, it's very easy to kind of cover for yourself because you mm. can coast for years through mm. the school system. Even like now it. in schools, I think and, that mm. can be the case. Yeah, and uh, and so you know, I I didn't know, they didn't know. My mum carries a bit of guilt because she didn't know. But the thing the thing is, um, neurodivergence runs in families. Mm. The reason they didn't yeah. notice is because I was like them. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but but you know, knowing that it, it it that has made an enormous difference to my life. So karate mm. got me this far. You know, I I don't. I don't know how I would have survived without it because mm. um, I self made self medicated with alcohol for years just to try and control my anxiety, and um, you know went from job to job and mm. you know didn't didn't do very well at school and you know I went to a really good school it was one of the best schools in the country when I went I went to the Skinners you know Skinners and um, I I didn't even get an A level out of it. I, mm. I did my GCSEs there. They weren't they weren't spectacular considering mm. what I was capable of. Right. So I mean, this is the curse of a lot of people with ADHD. They kind of get branded as gifted kids as children because they have this hyper focus, and when they're into something, they just mm. you know yes. overachieve. Um, but then when you know when I lost interest or it became difficult, mm. I didn't want to do it, and mm. I didn't do it. So this is why I had two cracks at A levels. And pretty much failed both times because yeah. I just wasn't wasn't uh, focused on it. And mm. you know, I've recently started taking medication for my ADHD. It's made such a difference to my life. It's incredible. Um, really? So mm. 
I might so, you know, speak to you about that as well. I know, yeah. I felt like we could have a whole other podcast <laughs> on ne- neurodivergence. That's exactly to be what honest. I was about to say, John. Um, we've only scratched the surface with you. Bass playing, mm. games master. We have you back because you're now my official nutritionist. Okay. <laughs> and what we do is I do a couple of shorts of me being weighed by you. <laughs> weighed, that is weighed, not laid. Um, <laughs> and we'll come back again, John, and we'll touch, we'll touch the surface. We'll talk about the games master and we'll talk about bass playing and we'll talk a bit more about nutrition. Yeah, you happy with great. that? Because mm. we definitely won't be, this would be going three hours, I think. If we yeah, have, have we been good. going that long? We'd be going about an hour and a 20, I'd say. Oh, right. wow. Yeah, hmm. yeah. And I think that's a, a good sort of time to wrap it up, unless you've got anything else to say. What, ideal people for your rock hard nutrition and your details of rock hard nutrition. Okay, I, ideal people. Um, I mean, I I want to help uh, the kids who are like me. So they might be neurodivergent. They hated PE at school. They couldn't wait to leave school, so they didn't have to do PT any, uh, PE anymore. Um, also looking for people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and they've been left behind. They they They, they never really got into fitness. They never understood it. Um, uh, these could be people with uh, sensory issues or anxiety who don't want to walk into a gym all those people um, I can help you Um, I'm like you I know what your problems are and I can help you with them so you know just uh, just give us a shout Um, I have a website and a Facebook page Um, my website is uh, rockhardnutritionandpt.com um all one word and i would absolutely love to hear from you you know you you don't have to call me i don't like talking on the phone much either to be fair you, if you want <laughs> you can send me an email you can send me a whatsapp all the details are on the website um we can have a chat there's no massive pressure i don't do high pressure sales tactics i'm not going to get you in my office and start twisting your arm and saying you've got to you know um sign away your firstborn or anything like that you know um i do do subscriptions but that's because it's a it's a good way to manage long-term goals but uh it's probably not as expensive as you think it is either i work from home so i don't have the overheads that gyms do so um you know i'm probably going to be cheaper than most of the personal trainers so um you know, give me a call. I can help you. You won't be lifting rusty kettlebells in the rain. You, I, I, yeah. <laughs> this so, is what I hear this every week. Uh, a lot of people. <laughs> now, now this is because of a common, a common misunderstanding. Um, so people have a, men- a lot of people have a mental image of a personal trainer being um, the outdoor, Rocky's, out, Rocky's, um, outdoor, manager. Yeah, outdoors, blowing a whistle, shouting, chasing and, chickens, uh, making people, uh do push-ups in in muddy fields and things like that and that that's boot camp that's not that's not necessarily pt uh so some pts do boot camp but that is not the be all and end all of pt i don't like outdoor training either we can train in a nice warm comfortable private (laughs) studio um where no one will see you sweating but me but i don't care so you know it's all good you'll you'll be you know You'll be fine. You'll be comfortable. Well looked after, I think. You'll be well looked yeah. after. So uh, you can bring friend. You can bring a friend with you if you want. You can bring a chaperone. It's uh, it's all good. The only limitation is uh, is how much room there is in 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 the physical room. So you know, if if that sounds like your kind of thing, then I'd love to hear from you. Perfect. What I love, and he's, he should be a voiceover of guy as well, shouldn't he? He's got that voice, isn't it? I could listen. To I mean, John. you do everything else. So yeah, you should definitely do the sound your, um, over. I could honestly listen to you. I was going to say all night, but that sounds a bit weird. But I could listen to you all day long, John. You've got that voice. That's um, yeah, reassuring. Yeah, yeah. Good reassuring voice. Thank you very much. Oh well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Oh, I did. And you felt more comfortable than you was anticipating. Oh, I was so nervous. Was you? <laughs> yeah, it's easy, isn't it? That's no, it's all right once you get going, isn't and you it? have to come back. I I would love to. That would be okay. awesome. And we'll do some little short videos of my progress. Mm. And you'll be in that and a little bit of publicity for you as well. So that's oh, good, it's got to be done. Okay. If you want to advertise on the Cherrywood podcast, what do they have to do? <laughs> I know you wouldn't know. So uh, just contact us on cherrywoodpro.com <laughs> forward slash podcast and all the information's on there. Got any questions? If you want to be on the show or we'll come to the same web address that I just said, which I can no longer remember, even though I've just said it. Uh, uh, or any other backup Rachels. Any other, yeah. Any that can any get closer Rachels. to Rachel Burridge than Rachel Kerridge, I think. Mm, that's that's not possible. Should contact you. <laughs> Unless I marry another Rachel, which is possible. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Cheers.
This podcast has been brought to you by Snug Dubs Camper Van Hire. Roam the world, park anywhere. That's snugdubs.co.uk.